Okay, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Stuart Edwards to today's Mentor Live. Uh, Stuart he works at Reading University and he's going to talk to us about his work with farmers, recorders and butterflies as part of the showcase project. So over to you, Stuart. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk here today. Um, as Kieran said, I'm here to talk about citizen science and the work that uh, we've been doing over the past year, looking at how citizen science can be incorporated into um, monitoring of biodiversity on farmland. Uh, my, my background in citizen science sort of, ex I guess it started probably about 20 years ago when I started recording reptiles and amphibians uh, for the amphibian reptile group. Um, and then that sort of extended to taking over and helping to run the local reptile amphibian group and teaching other members of the public um, how to, to record and survey for reptiles and amphibians, obviously contributing to a very long-term citizen science project. And so when this opportunity to, to work on within citizen science again, and on farmland, an area where I've um, really uh, been involved with academically, I suppose, based at university in the School of Agriculture, Oh, when this opportunity came up, I was really looking forward to get my, my teeth stuck in. It's a really enjoyable area. So today I'm going to be just giving you a quick flick through. Um, well, I'm going to be talking about biodiversity and farming in general, just a quick introduction to the subject. An introduction to the showcase project, which is the big EU project that we've been working on and um, what my work is effectively part of. Uh, and then we'll be working, so yeah, I'll be introducing my case study of UK butterfly monitoring on farmland and how we incorporated butterfly conservation's uh, local volunteers um, to take part in uh, the wider countryside butterfly monitoring scheme methodology uh, and recording butterflies on, on UK farmland. Then I'm going to talk about a little event that we did for uh, linking the environment and farming, LEAFS, Open Farm Sunday, where we engage members of the public in butterfly surveying, um, and then, of course, then I'll be coming up with and then I'll be concluding with the, the future workshops and uh, opportunities for other people to, people to engage. I'm also going to apologise if I talk too quick. I'm absolutely freezing in this office and um, yeah, it's very cold. <laughs> so approximately 40 percent of European land is considered to be farmland. And of this, 76% uh, of farmland habitat and 70% of their inhabitant species are reported to have unfavorable conservation state status. And there are many reasons attributed to this. So um, landscape complexity sort of decreased uh, as we increased the production of food to meet the demand for food demand uh, over the coming, uh, over the previous years. Um, and then obviously we started seeing as a result of this a decline in uh, in biodiversity. So we, we've seen links of neonicotinoids that influence insect and subsequently bird populations. We've seen how the use of glyphosate can impact amphibians. Um, it sort of inf influences the, the migratory patterns and sort of causes major declines and, and death to amphibians that are mi mi migrating across farmland to their breeding pools. And of course, we're seeing landscape uh, intensification um, simplification leading to invertebrate declines subsequently um, decreasing populations of other uh, char more charismatic in many pla many places um, species populations over time so but the demand for food keeps on increasing now I have mentioned um, the influence of uh, landscape complexity and simplification on, on biodiversity, but we're seeing an increase in biodiversity friendly interventions. So long gone are the days that you might see sort of vast open expanses of fields, as you can see on the top of your screen here with the, the combines going through harvesting. And we're moving to kind of more complex looking habitats for the benefit of invertebrates. We're seeing the, uh, the, the introduction of pollinator strips to increase pollinators. Uh, Yet yeah, these are actually quite costly to implement, and at the moment there is little evidence. Well, there is there there's evidence, but you know, j j just there's a there's not much difference between the amount of cost to um, produce or to to utilize these interventions um, compared to the, the gain of the ecosystem services. So there is a need to identify ways in which biodiversity can be incentivized and integrated into modern day farming practices. 
And that's where our showcase project came in. So showcase is an EU funded project uh, started in 2000, comprising of 23 member organizations across 15 different countries. And the, the, the wider scheme, the wider goal is to find ways of um, it, incorporating modern day, uh, incorpor incorporating biodiversity into modern day farming practices. And we've done this for a pan-European network of experimental biodiversity areas, which I can show you a bit about and tell you a bit about in a bit. We've analyzed current frameworks and incentives farmers that and incentives farmers get and motivations and models of implementation of these biodiversity friendly farming practices. Um, we're providing evidence of the interactions between biodiversity and agriculture. And we're also looking at the motives for stakeholders to embrace uh, the reciprocal benefits of agriculture and biodiversity. So talking a bit more about these in experimental biodiversity areas, um, Showcase developed a pan-European network of 11 experimental biodiversity areas across 10 different countries with contrasting farm systems. And so for each of these, each, um, each country has looked at a different biodiversity-friendly intervention. So some may be looking at po pollinator strips, wildflower strips, um, others have looked at different methods of uh, cover crops and how winter tolerance of cover crops, uh, yeah, free, free, freeze tolerance of cover crops can influence the rate at which um, the nutrients uh, flush into the ground at the end uh, throughout the winter and how that influences yield. And that's something that we've been doing here in the UK. So there's a nice frosty picture here. We were out um, monitoring uh, earthworm populations uh, at sort of minus six in January, trying to work out how these different uh, cover crop combinations could influence biodiversity. So we looked at earthworm spiders. Um, uh, foliage coverage uh, per, per square meter, for example. And I guess one thing that all of these interventions had in common was the biodiversity that we were monitoring. So we're now at a stage where we're th synthesizing this data. Um, so we're able to compare the influence of different biodiversity interventions on different taxa, but also ultimately on, on yield. Because, of course, we want to improve the, the state of biodiversity on farmland whilst not compromising, compromising yield. Um, and if you want to hear a bit more about this project, there's an there's a Ento Live talk coming up on the 17th of April by uh, Millie Hood, who oversaw the, the UK EBA. And this one's spiders, earthworms, and beetles, the impacts of cover crop tolerance. Um, and I really recommend uh, uh, going to this talk and learning more about some of the work that we've done here in the UK, but hopefully she'll also expand and talk about some of the work done in, in Europe. Now, there's various expected results from, from the project as mentioned. So there may be business models for biodiversity management. We're working on a handbook at the moment for how to integrate, integrate biodiversity into farm farm management, and there'll be an element of the citizen science in there. We have uh, open access data sets, uh, sets of tested biodiversity indicators, a framework for the current evidence on agriculture and biodiversity across Europe. And then, of course, what I'm here to talk to you about today is the citizen science uh, incorporating our platform and application of citizen science on, on farmland across Europe. Now, I don't need to talk, well, I don't think I need to talk too much on uh, citizen science and biological recording, uh, being that this is a biological recording network um, company talk, but for, um, for completeness, I will give you a quick introduction. So uh, citizen science is an incredibly valuable uh, resource in monitoring species uh, distribution and population trends, uh, and increases, it increases a... Uh, interest and awareness and empowerment among the uh, members of the public with re regards to global issues such as biodiversity decline and engaging um, uh, and sustainable food production. So basically it incorporates members of the public in scientific research to collect important data. Uh, and in the UK, we're blessed by a lot of um, really good and impactful um, citizen science projects such as butterfly conservation, uh, overseeing with a big butterfly count here. They there's also the, the wider countryside butterfly monitoring scheme, the UK butterfly monitoring scheme, which I'll talk about a bit more um, uh, later on. We've got the UK pollinator monitoring scheme. In the freshwater realms, we've got Riverfire Partnership, quite a successful um, biological recording of uh, well river flies in the UK. And then moving up to the more 
uh, charismatic me megafauna. Um, you, you could be looking at your birds through the the big garden bird watch, uh, and then looking more at sort of in the in the plant realms. We've got Fruit Watch, which was actually initiated here in at the University of Reading, which is monitoring the the phenology of fruit tree bud burst, uh, not just in the UK anymore, but also exp uh, expanding into the rest of Europe. So generally, biological uh, citizen science involvement in biological or in, in a biodiversity realm involves biological recording, and these are obviously the building blocks of taxonomy. Uh, they help to identify new species, new variants of species. They help us assess conservation status of species, monitoring their trends over, over time and space. Um, and we're, we're able to identify uh, vulnerable species from these, monitor extinction rates and identify threats, for example, climate change being the, the key one. Uh, biological recording supports sound planning and allows us once again to engage public and increase their interest in, with regards to biodiversity uh, related issues. Now, there's also policy relevance to uh, biological recording and citizen science at the moment. So back in um, November, there was a new, site, new, new EU policy for pollinators, uh, which recognizes the importance of citizen science for monitoring uh, and identifies the improvements needed to support citizen science and farmers and sharing good, uh, good practice when, uh, with regards to um, how uh, recording should be conducted and the data shared. And of course, here it mentions the European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, uh, which is a great shout out. Um, and hopefully, hopefully they can, uh, similar projects from what we have about to talk to you about today, incorporating uh, butterfly conservation methods. Uh, hopefully a similar uh, system can be imp imp implemented in Europe in the future. And if policy, policy is your kind of thing, a uh, showcase have uh, also recently produced a, a policy brief for farmers and a link will be, be sent around um, in, in the corresponding blog here. But obviously some of the key messages you can see here, effective biodiversity conservation um, requires action on farmland, agricultural management affects a wide range of biodiversity-based ecosystem services that help sustain human life. Uh, I've mentioned the costs here. So currently the costs of managing for more biodiversity or uh, on farms are generally higher than the ecosystem service benefits that this provides to farmers. And of course, policy interventions are needed that make biodiversity enhancing management on farms economically rewarding. So moving a bit further into uh, showcases citizen science projects, um, there's two elements to showcase in citizen science. Uh, we've got um, at a European level where we've conducted a, a wide range review. And this is a co comprehensive review of existing citizen science approaches involving biodiversity monitoring citizen science. Um, I should really send a link around to this as well, sorry. Uh, incorporating SLU, uh, the Dutch Butterfly Conservation in the University of Reading. So this is a uh, comprehensive review, a combination of three systematic and illustrative review methods using, utilizing a literature search, uh, Google search, and uh, links to partner uh, organizations. Uh, we identified 106 different programs that met our search criteria across 20 countries regarding um, the use of citizen science on farm and biological research, uh, farm and biodiversity research. And we developed a typology of eight types of programs characterized by data collected and nature of volunteer involvement. And as you can see here, we have um, the different types of programs, um, categories that we've managed to, to categorize um, citizen science related on farmland, uh, farmland related citizen science projects, sorry. Uh, we've developed a, a monitoring app from the, uh, the Dutch butterfly conservation um, and this is called Insects Count. So it's a pollinator monitoring app with gamification. Uh, there's four ways to record, um, say flower, say we've got flower visiting insects, for example, using time counts, which are 15 minutes counts. There's flower patch counts. And of course there's the transit counts as well and incidental observation. And the idea with this app um, was that we wanted to create a, get, uh, an app which would reward uh, the the user for inputting um, recording data. So there, as you can see, there are badges here 
um, and you'll get badges for the certain species that you um, you record, the number of flowers you you, you visit, the, the species groups counted, and then uh, you you can export this data and look at regional statistics, uh, how this compares to the to the rest of the country, what are the management practices that you've incorporated, um, and how this may influence um, the biodiversity that you may find. Now, um, specifically for, I mean, it says here it's tested in the UK, Sweden and Spain, but actually the UK is really well advanced in terms of the, um, the amount of apps and citizen science projects that are running in the UK compared to the rest of Europe. So moving forward, uh, we opted not to use the, the Insects Counts uh, app for, for our on-ground research, looking at how um, citizen science can influence palm, palm perception of biodiversity and biodiversity friendly practices. But moving more specifically onto the on the ground research that we've been doing, um, we wanted to look at ways in which we can build links between the scientific and agricultural communities. Uh, generally, farmers are underrepresented, uh, underrepresented in citizen science research and same goes for, for um, farmland. So we wanted to understand how best to collect data on farmland and gain insights in how best to engage farmer and volunteer communities and then explore these relationships using questionnaires. Um, of course, by collecting such data, we could contribute to learning more about the distribution and trends of species in underrecorded places and uh, better understand how biodiversity can influence agricultural productivity. So overall, we wanted to gain an understanding of how engaging farmers in recording and biodiversity research can help understand and conserve biodiversity while safeguarding agricultural productivity. Now, this, the aim of this, the, the, the scope of this research spanned across Europe. So we, we had a study site in Spain at the Doniana uh, National Park. So in Spain, we wanted to engage uh, farmers in collecting data on butterflies using the Showcase app and use volunteers to collect data on farmland uh, and feedback to the farmers in a workshop capacity. Uh, in Sweden, we asked uh, farmers to monitor biodiversity on farmland again using the app. Um, and then we wanted to contact as well existing citizen science schemes with recorders and recording on farmland. And the way we unified everyone's data was use, utilizing this questionnaire for, for farmers and recorders. But as I previously mentioned in the UK, we, we really don't want to, to muddy the biological diver, but biodiversity recording uh, water with an, an, another app for recording. So we wanted to capitalize on one of the already very successful existing programs. So we've um, we decided to use butterflies as a, as a study system because they're great indicators of changes in the, the local environment due to their short life cycle and high mobility. They're extremely easy to, to identify and um, you know just the, the identification uh, sheet that Kiron mentioned earlier for about four pounds, you've got a great start for getting out and being able to identify butterflies. Uh, and then you've got, uh, so moving on to the Butterfly Conservation's UK uh, Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. It's one of the largest and longest running insect monitoring schemes in the world. Um, the scheme began in 1976 and now records data on over 2,000 sites per year, incorporating butterfly transects, uh, weekly butterfly but, uh, transects, the wider countryside butterfly monitoring survey, which is slightly lower intensity, and then the timed count survey. Uh, the UK BMS data set is one of the largest important, uh, one of the most important resources for, ident for understanding changes in insect populations in the world. Um, so what we did was we recruited 20 uh, recorders from the local butterfly conservation um, regional networks of, of recorders. Um, and then we recruited 20 farmers uh, from local farm cluster groups, which have proved to be a great resource for recruiting uh, farmers. Now that farmers are working together uh, to pr pr promote landscape changes and provide landscape changes of, to biodiversity um, and conservation. Um, there were no restrictions on farming type or sizes, but this generally, uh, we generally recruited from the south of England. So we ended up with farmers from Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, uh, Berkshire, Wiltshire, Hampshire, uh, and Surrey. And we wanted to engage them using the, the, the methodology of the wider countryside butterfly monitoring survey. 
So I went on a, a, well, every time we recruited a farmer, I went on a trip to their farm and we spoke about the uh, the general, you know, what, what they do to, um, what they provide for wildlife on their farmlands and how they might want to, to collect data on certain areas with regard to, uh, uh, how they might want to collect data on the butterfly on their far of the butterflies on their farmland in certain areas. Uh, and so the methodology of the wider countryside butterfly monitoring scheme is that you set up two one kilometer transects and you monitor uh, at least twice between the months of, I believe it was May and September. And you go and visit these um, transects um, at least, yes, yeah, so at least twice during those that time period and you record the the abundance and the species of butterflies that you see on uh, on the farms during this time. So it's a count data um, method of surveying. Once we'd so once I visited the farm, we'd set up the the would mark out the one kilometer transects, and this was generally based on um, interventions that farmers had uh, already incorporated. So this may be wildflower margins. They may have an area of woodland on their farmland. Um, it may just be a very prolific hedgerow that they want to, they're very interested in understanding um, the biodiversity surrounding it, or they may be comparing areas of high and low productivity. We then recruited a, uh, a recorder and introduced them to the farmer. And from there, it was a, it was up to the, the recorder and the farmer as to what level of engagement they, they you know, how much they committed to, to this project. As long as, uh, so there were instances where farmers um, walk these transects on their own. There were instances where the, the recorder went along and recorded on the farmland at least twice, taking the farmers with them. And there are instances where farmers um, just provided access. And this is generally due to time constraints. Um, we had some very knowledgeable uh, farmers uh, who just didn't have the time to get out and record biodiversity on their farms. And this is something that we need to you know, consider when we're thinking about recording on farmland in the future. And then we unite, and, and then at the end of the, the surveying season, the stage we're kind of at now, we, we uh, as I said, we united the three countries research with these social science surveys, which ex which investigated the experience, knowledge and attitudes um, and how they may have changed in relation to, part, uh, with regards to participating in, in our projects um, and how this may influence their links to farming practices. We also provided a, a questionnaire to, to recorders uh, to understand uh, their motivations for wanting to, to record on farmland, the motivations for why they, they record in the first place and how they may have feel, felt their skills have changed as a result of, of engaging in this project. So we're, here are some preliminary results so far. Um, we're still chasing up the last few farmers and recorders for, for, for results. Um, but from eight farms, we've received biodiversity data for, we've seen 2,715 different butterflies across 25 different species. The most common being our, our meadow, meadow brown, which is a common uh, grassland species. And we've also seen some of the more rarer species such as Gerarga species, um, which could be seen along the, the, uh, the chalklands from uh, our, our Wiltshire and Hampshire populations. But of course, there are many positive outcomes beyond um, the biodiversity data that we've collected. So there are many continuing partnerships this year now, um, or next season as it would be. Um, there have been more, there's been indications of more intensive surveying in, uh, being planned and prepared. So um, whereas we had one recorder visit twice, uh, during the survey season, they're now going to visit monthly. But also that recorder has gone out of his way and they've started doing uh, egg counts for, uh, I believe it's brown hair streak uh, on their farmland over winter. Uh, and of course, we've seen species recorded in places that we've never seen them recorded before. So we had an instance where um, the farmer came over at the beginning in the initial introduction with the recorder, the farmer came over to us with a picture of... Um, a butterfly that they had on, on the Budley or outside their house. And it was a marsh fertility. And actually we'd linked them up with a county recorder for that area um, for this particular surveying site. And he said that one hadn't been recorded uh, in approximately 65 miles for, for a great period of time. So that, that was a great anecdotal um, benefit of, of the project so far. So some preliminary um, 
results from our farmer feedback, um, we, we basically asked a multitude of questions, which included Likert scales. So um, they responded one for not, they didn't it, they didn't feel it influenced their their ability or or impacted them at all, or five where they they were very much um, influenced or it did have an impact on on their abilities. So we've seen a general increase in um, their butterfly identification skills. This is on the farmer side. Their knowledge of the ecological roles of butterflies has generally increased. Uh, their interest in butterflies has increased and they've developed a greater understanding of the types of habitats butterflies need. Um, generally, the, the, uh, the appreciation for the natural world has increased and you know, that one of the highest results here, butterfly monitoring is likely to, to continue on their farm in the future. And this is due to the, the long lasting relationships that we've set up. And in general, the farmers are more open and interested in contributing to other citizen science recording schemes. And this is an area being widely um, explored now, um, both by us and other, well, by us and other members um, uh, of, in industry and in academia in the UK and Europe at the moment. Um, so then we've got, do you feel you have learned anything from the data you've recorded that can be applied directly to your farming practices? And here are some of the key quotes. So no two years are the same despite the same habitat. So they're learning about variability in populations. Um, we've, we've had indications that providing specific habitats to aid the growth of biodiversity is important. And so they're considering their wildflower mixtures. Um, and then this final one on the bottom right of your screen, it is confirmation of benefits of increased wild margins. So some are already reflecting on the the influence of uh, their wild wild margin, their, their, their flower, flower margins on biodiversity already. Now looking at the um, the recorder responses, we generally ask, did you feel there are any added benefits to you beyond your regular monitoring or your participation in projects um, involving contact with farmers. And there are some key themes here. So they, they, they generally found it very rewarding to work with farmers who care about conservation. Um, and their, their findings are often received with enthusiasm. Um, it's a reminder of those within the farming, that those in the, within the farming community remain committed to sustainable agriculture. And some of the, the recorders felt they were directly influenced in land management practices. There's a social element here so I so here's a quote here. I've now got to know both the landowner and the farm manager, and they now accompany them on the, the surveys on occasion. And they've opened up the whole new circle of friends and social connections. One of the most uh, endearing stories I think to come out of this for us is that there was an instance between um, some recorders and a farmer where the recorders took the farmer's grandchildren out um, and taught them about the butterflies and biodiversity on their farmland um, on the surveys. You know, so we're really we've managed to touch almost the farmers of tomorrow. Um, so it's, it's yeah, a really touching story for us and you know, a good reason why we still do this kind of stuff. Um, and then of course you've got in more generalized, you know, this access to the wider landscape that is normally private, opportunity to experience habitat that is not otherwise uh, open, to, open to access. So where are we hoping to go with this? Well, we've got a meeting next week with our European partners to, to produce a full analysis of both quantitative and qualitative data. Um, this will result in uh, hopefully some recommendations and best, best practice guides for fostering citizen science slash farmer relationships, not just in um, the UK, but also the, the wider European context. Um, we're certainly starting to identify some of the bottlenecks in this research. So um, they're generally farmers are really interested in, you know, I guess it's, it's almost one of the benefits is free surveying, right? You've got people, uh, engaging on their on their land and providing them with uh, biodiversity uh, biodiversity data, um, we could actually get enough recorders um, to um, to meet our farmer demand here, and that may be something to do with uh, the timing of recruitment of recorders, or perhaps the the way we advertise things to recorders, um, and that's something to consider in the future with regards to expanding on on this project, or perhaps when we consider engaging other citizen science projects con considering other taxa. So uh, moving on now onto our next part of the project. Um, and this was just, just a bit of an opportunity really. Uh, so for, there's, a, there's an organization called Link in the Environment and Farming. And every year since 2006, um, they've encouraged farmers to open their, their farmland 
uh, to members of the public to be able to um, showcase, I suppose, British agriculture um, and some of the processes that go on on, on farmland. And since 2006, uh, they've had over 1,600 farmers open their, open their farms. So it's a really successful scheme. And so what we thought, well, this, this would be a good idea to engage members of the public on, on, on farmland. And so we could do this using uh, butterfly walks and timed counts. As you may recall, I mentioned earlier, butterfly conservation do 15 minute time counts, or not necessarily 15 minute, but timed counts um, for recording uh, butterfly species within a certain area. And so we saw it as an opportunity to collect data and feedback to the farmer. And this occurred in June on what was probably one of the hottest days of the year. Um, so we had three farms participate. Um, and what we did was we recruited um, a recorder. And here's a, a recorder from, I believe this Buckingham, Buckingham Shears recording group uh, from Butterfly Conservation. Uh, they came along. Uh, we had a member, an academic member from the University of Reading. He here's my um, my colleague Alice Mocklin. Um, and the idea was we'd set up and we'd take members of the public on timed counts for fifteen minutes across different parts of the farmland throughout the day. Um, and so we had one hundred and thirteen different people uh, come across the the three farms. And then at the end, we provided them with a voluntary survey. As you can see, we got poor. Well, I suppose a fifth of an uptake is something good. Uh, level of respondents gained, gauging their knowledge uh, and perception of citizen science and their farmers and also we provided the data to the farmers for their perspective on uh, biodiversity. Now farmers were generally positive about the experience of having members of the public on the farm and recording biodiversity. Uh, the recorders really enjoyed engaging with the members of the public um, and then we asked so two simple questions here. Uh, one was was the member of the public uh, aware of citizen science on farmland? And we've got here a resounding 61%, 62% uh, near enough saying, yes, they're aware of citizen science. Um, and almost 40% say they're not aware of citizen science. But three, individ three individuals here indicate that they're aware of citizen science, but hadn't known the term of citizen science. So I guess that's something we should consider um, when promoting citizen science projects, I suppose, what are the other names that it could perhaps be um, incorporated into and how other people might interpret it in yeah inter interpret it and then we asked uh, were you aware that farmers are working to conserve biodiversity on farmland and thankfully um many knew about conservation on farmland um so a good 76 percent said yes and one of the the, the quotes which um we really, we really enjoyed was uh, the the influence of Clarkson's farm, and how how they've learned about conservation of farmland from watching Clarkson's farm, uh, and then obviously there's the twenty four percent that said no, uh, they thought it was very commercial. They thought farmers just mowed everything or grazed everything, and some even imagined the first scene in Watership Down. So obviously quite uh, a different um, view compared compared to the the, the op 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 opposing. Um, the use of uh, Clarkson's farm and the knowledge of biodiversity and farming. Um, so yeah, overall, that was a really enjoyable day. You know, it was really good to get members of the public um, out um, and, and show them uh, the, the different types of, I, I know we were doing time butterfly counts, but we we're also seeing other butterfly, uh, other forms of biodiversity, such as the birds and the, the wasps, et cetera. And so that sort of concludes the work that we've been doing uh, regarding citizen science on, on farming. Um, but we don't want to make it sort of like a flash in the pan sort of thing. So this was one year in the UK. Uh, and so I've received a, a little pot of funding um, to run a couple of workshops to, to identify ways in which we can um, scale up our partnerships. So hopefully um, increase the, the amount of butterfly surveys, for example, being conducted on farm throughout the UK. Um, and so starting with um, workshop one, we want to identify the biodiversity needs of UK farmers for decision-making. Um, we forced butterfly survey, butterfly surveying on farmers and citizen science for this project because it's such a well-established um, citizen science scheme. But actually, you know, what what data do farmers actually want? 
Um, it might not be butterflies, it may be earthworms, it may be birds, for example. And so we're going to, in, in March, on March the 15th, um, we're going to run a workshop here at the University of Reading, but also hybrid, um, where we invite farmers to participate and help really understand what um, biodiversity data they want and what do they need to make informed decisions on, on farming. And th this workshop is going to incorporate farmers, farm cluster coordinators, agricultural consultants and agronomists. So if anyone in the, in the, the audience here would be interested, uh, please do get in touch. And then following this, we're going to have a second um, workshop to identify the capacity of citizen science schemes to cater for these needs. And that's going to be a big workshop, probably in May, incorporating once again farmers, farm cluster coordinators, citizen scientists, biological recorders, uh, citizen science program coordinators. Um, and hopefully we can set up some really good long lasting relationships between um, farming groups and citizen science groups. Um, because that there's benefits to be had for farmers, but also there's benefits to the recorders as being highlighted through this project, you know, that they, they, they really enjoy this social element and this this access to areas um, that they haven't previously accessed before. So if, if you think you'd be interested in joining us um, in one of these um, workshops, please do contact me using um, the email address here. Um, but also attached, uh, I, I think there's one attached to the project, uh, the, the talk description, right? If not, there'll be one in the blog um, when it gets um, sent out. So thank you again for listening, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions.